Welcome everybody to this 50 minute presentation. And I decided to call it music therapy from an Ayurvedic perspective. Um, and so <clears throat> before anything else, I'd like to begin with a few invocations. So I invite you to chant along um, and uh, to honor the, the tradition. It's always auspicious to begin with a few mantras. So I'd like to start with Ganesha, just three times chanting Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha together. So when you're ready, let's begin. Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha and Then I'd like to chant Yakundendu for Saraswati, who's the goddess of music. So I felt very appropriate for this presentation. Ya kundendu tushara harad havala ya shibra vastra vrita ya vina bardanda mandita kara ya shveta padmasana ya brahma chuta shankara prabhriti bhir devai sada pujita Samam patu saraswati bhagavati nishesha jadya paha. So we pray for her blessings. <clears throat> and lastly, for um, we're going to do Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, which is uh, to invoke the blessings of. Guru, which is our own inner guidance system um, and which represents knowledge and positivity. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwaraha, Guru Sakshat Param Brahma. Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Harihi Om. So also to acknowledge my teachers, so I received my music therapy accreditation from Eastern Michigan University, so the various teachers there um, that I just uh, want to acknowledge. And then after that I had the opportunity to study uh, for six months in Albuquerque uh, I believe about three of those were with Dr. Laud. And a little bit about my story with music therapy is I went through music therapy school, which was an undergraduate degree, um, knowing about Ayurveda and sometimes feeling like music therapy was like a baby, like an infant, uh, you know, in terms of how it's practiced and feeling like, you know, oh, maybe, you know, I, I had many occasions where I almost dropped out because I wanted to go study, you know, something like Ayurveda or that I thought had more depth, you know, because it was so much more ancient and music therapy is, you know, again, so young compared to, to Ayurveda. And, um, but uh, I did end up completing that program um, somehow. I just kind of uh, different, different people encouraged me that, you know, it, um, even though I felt that way, that maybe I should just kind of stick through it. And then I went and 
and I, stu I had the opportunity to study Ayurveda and I realized that a lot of the things I had learned in music therapy school were very Ayurvedic. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I understood that, you know, we can call something Ayurveda or we could call something music therapy, but the, the idea is what is it really? Because those are labels in a sense. So. Um, I'm going to just grab this and come back there. So, one definition of the scope of Ayurveda, just to understand what are we talking about. When we talk about Ayurveda, there's a shloka, um, hita hitam sukham dukham, ayus tasya hita hitam, manam cha tatcha yatroktam, Ayurveda sa uchyate. So that means, this is saying, what is the scope of Ayurveda? It's that science where what is useful and not useful to health and life, what is conducive to happiness and unhappiness, what's good and bad for life and for longevity, and where life itself is described. Like Ayurveda is that science where we are, are discussing, basically, in brief, what's good for us and what's not good for us. And so any therapy, if it is effective in bringing more balance, can be looked at from an Ayurvedic lens. Um, and, and so I realized that, you know, th those are just ideas in my head, that it was, you know, that one thing was better than the other thing, you know, etc. So really our main concern is not with what it's called, but with our life, you know, and how to live fully and, um, and to be well, you know, and har harmonious. Um, okay, so... Then we come to this idea of what I was exposed to in Ayurveda was a way of looking at, at our experiences. Um, who here has heard of the 20 gunas? I know we've all heard of the three gunas. Okay, so Ishwari has heard of the 20 gunas. Have you heard of the 20 gunas? Okay, okay. Um, this is a relatively simple thing, actually. If you really understand uh, it, it can change your, I think it can really change your life. Um, and again, this is Ayurveda, it's just, um, so there's 10 qualities. There's a shloka, mm. so okay, just for fun because I enjoyed chanting these shlokas. Guru Manda Hima Snigdha Shlakshna Sandra Mridusthira Guna Sasukshma Vishada Vimsati Saviparyaya So this is Sanskrit. Um, yeah. And it's listing 10 gunas. Guna just means quality. And it's saying these 10 gunas plus their opposites are the 20 gunas, the 20 qualities. So the ancient sages, they looked at nature and they said everything has different attributes. Some things are more heavy, some things are more light, some things are cold or hot or, or, or oily or dry or subtle or gross. And so they distilled it down into 10 pairs of opposites, these different qualities. And I think on some level, we all kind of know these, you know, like uh, if you're feeling spacey and you drink a lot of caffeine, which will increase that quality of lightness, then you'll feel more spacey. So it's that quality of like increases, this principle, like increases like. If, if, if you're very 
lightheaded and you have something very heavy to eat or, or oily or unctuous, it may ground you. You know, we have this experience like if you eat root vegetables, you may tend to feel a little bit more grounded. If you eat only salad, you'll start to fly away. So this is like the basic, one of the basic philosophies of Ayurveda is these qualities in nature and like increases like and opposites balance. So if you're overheated and you eat ice cream, it may help you, <laughs> you know, or drink mint tea, it may help you. But if you're overheated and you drink, you know, pepper, uh, sorry, ginger tea, it may further aggravate. Um, so this idea of these gunas. So now I'll move over here. And, um, I promise this is the most theoretic. It's going to get it's downhill from here. It's, it's not going to be heavy theory. Um, so we have Guru and Lagu, heavy, light, Manda, Tikshna, slow, fast, Hima and Ushna, cold and hot, Snigdha and Ruksha, oily or dry. See how they're opposites. Shlakshna and Kara, smooth and rough, Sandra and Drava, dense or liquid or like dispersing, spreading. Ridu and Kartina, soft or hard. Stira and Chala, stable or mobile, moving. Sukshma and Stula, subtle and gross. Vishada and Avila, clear or cloudy. Um, now, have you all heard of the three doshas? So that's something you all know. So, so each of the doshas has certain qualities which describe it. So actually all these ones on the left happen to be qualities of... Um, actually, except these two. All of these on the left, up one through eight, are qualities of kapha. Heavy, kapha is heavy, slow, cold, oily, smooth, dense, soft, and stable. You know, if you're kapha, you just want to sit and watch TV. <laughs> um, that's the tendency for kapha, rather than moving around, you know, you're very, you know, grounded. Um, and the attack will tend to, you know, um, have these qualities. Maybe oily skin, for example. And then, um, you know, so the opposites of these would reduce kapha, would balance kapha, right? So similarly, um, I can give you, it's not necessary for us to go through all the doshas with their qualities. If you want, I have a handout you can make a copy of or take a photo of um, that lists the qualities of the three doshas, you know, like... Um, Pitta is, is um, tikshna, you know, fast and hot, and um, uh, you know also light, and and for example, um, clear, and then vata is dry, light, cold, um, rough, hard, mobile, all of these things. So the knowing the qualities of the dosha, knowing these qualities and then knowing the qualities of the doshas, you can brainstorm so many ways to balance the doshas, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and in Ayurveda, uh, you know, balance of the doshas is considered basically the key to health. Um, any questions so far about it? Okay. Um, and then, so first, there was this, you know, which is kind of like when you learn these gunas, you can 
start looking at your life through the through your guna goggles like through the lens of you know if you want to you can look at you know for example you know am i moving around moving 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 all the time and do i have some vata imbalance so that maybe i need to just sit and meditate a little bit you know that's like a really practical way to use that okay there's too much mobile in my life it means i need to sit and meditate or 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 shavasana or do something that just involves sit, you know being still or if i feel like i'm being a couch potato it means i need to go out and get some exercise so similarly any any experience in our life we can look at the qualities and just bring awareness um and then there's this idea of the tanmatra therapies that these gunas they affect us you know through our senses through our sensory experience so the tanmatras are the five sense experiences of smell taste form or sight touch and sound and so um so ayurveda talks about this chikitsa just means like a therapy so these are sen- sensory therapies so with a sense of smell we have aroma therapy and again the different smells can have different qualities like uh heating or cooling you know aromas can be there for example so again we use the idea of these qualities to understand how different aromas will influence our doshas and our our balance and then taste which is probably the most commonly known one mm-hmm. which is ayurvedic nutrition how different tastes and different foods have these qualities and so that will affect our health and our that that influences the doshas mm-hmm. and then we have color therapy which is sight um you know different colors red is a heating color blue is a cooling color so so red could for example balance kapha or um and uh you know a cooling color like blue or green could balance pitta um and so then there's that and then touch so this one is kind of interesting to me because we have massage therapy which is like the most obvious form of touch therapy but if you actually think about our experience of touch throughout the day um and what and how like what kind of sensations we're exposed to all of that can potentially also affect our doshas so for example if you decide not to sit on a cushion but to just sit on the hardwood floor you're uh being influenced by the, this quality of katina har so that could be good for a kapha but if you have vata and balance it's going to actually can aggravate your vata if you do it a lot if you're always sitting on concrete hardwood floor you know vatas will benefit from a cushion you know or when you're in shavasana put a a blanket to soften the surface when you do yoga nidra or something and that's actually very good for vata and again kapha maybe not um another thing is like what you wear like i tend to have vata high vata so like if i wear like a heavy sweater it's actually can help to balance vata can be grounding because it's heavy has you know gives me this feeling of feeling more heavy yeah or does temperatures come in like being cold or hot you know I see that with that be yeah yeah i see that in the gunas but in the chip chip pizza or whatever do you porn por- touch too yeah t- okay. in terms of temperature yeah that porn morte right. could you repeat the question for the recording yeah thank you 
Thank you for the question. So the question was, how does cold or hot fit into the the touch therapy, Tanmatra? So, so the idea is, you know, uh, the the climate. If you're in a very hot climate, you know, could increase pitta or balance vata and kapha. The the clothes you wear, if you, you know, um, if you stay cool, if you don't layer up as much, you, you know, that will help to balance pitta, but increase vata and kapha, or vice versa, if you layer up, you're going to balance vata. Um, yeah, so definitely, um, and we have, you know, there's different, of all these four senses, you know, there's aromas or tastes or colors um, or temperature that has a heating or cooling effect. Um, and these get, these move from gross to subtle. And so actually now when we get to the sound tanmatra, so sound therapy, which um, would include music therapy, because music, you know, is a form of sound, or travels, you know, is, is sound, you know, organized in a certain way. Um, it's a little bit, um, because I think it's subtle, some of these qualities are not so, you can't really apply them so obviously. Um, heavy light, maybe, you know, like I think of like a deep, you know, uh, low drum as being heavy to me. That's just like, you know, or like a high pitched, you know, little bongo being lighter. Slow and fast is obvious how that applies to music. Um, cold and hot, that one, I'm not so sure. And so that's, that's where, in my opinion, we can get creative. We can say, well, what is, what is music that to me feels heating or cooling? So for, to me, like, if I listen to like heavy metal, that to me that's like, you know, kind of like heating, yeah. Yeah, I think about heating as um, possibly being music that's more agitating or rajasic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I, or, yeah, and I think of cooling as maybe, you know, something very soothing, like relaxation, you know, like uh, massage therapy music, that kind of stuff. So not all of these apply so obviously to music. Um, it seems, you know, each one of us would probably have our own take on it a little bit different. But that's where, you know, Ayurveda is not a black and white science. We can be creative with it. The basic notion, though, that um, a sensory experience, in this case, uh, music, has certain qualities. And if you want to, if you want to try to sort of pigeonhole it into these qualities, that's fine. If you want to just say this has certain qualities, when I'm, when my organism or an organism is exposed to those qualities, it will increase those qualities within that person. And so, um, so like increases like and opposites balance. So the idea with music therapy from an Ayurvedic perspective is how can we use music to create balance in our life just by being aware of its qualities and our own qualities. Um, so, any questions so far? Yeah. Just a comment. I was thinking in looking at the Tan Mantras that, um, for instance, if I think about, you, you know, nutrition is um, relating to taste. Uh, mm -hmm. But in fact, if I looked at food, every one of those Tan Mantras, uh, I could fit into food, smell, taste, form and sight, touch, the sound. You know, it's all part of the sensory experience. 
Um, and I'm going to assume that you could very much relate all of them. There may be one that's more primary relating to music, but I'm thinking that all of them in some ways um, you could relate to music. Could you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's very true. Um, because music, you know, if, if, we're, if we're just listening to music, it's mostly just sound, that, you know, sound input. But if we're playing an instrument, then there's definitely a touch component that different instruments can have different textures. Um, and, you know, so I would say touch was pro would probably be the most applicable in that case, um, you know, form or sight, I guess, you know, we have the, you know, it's like, you can look at the instrument, but um, yeah, definitely, it's not black and white, like, and, and definitely, you know, like, uh, food has textures, and food has colors, mm -hmm. and that's all, mm -hmm. probably, yeah, so it's not like, this is just like a, a general, course, yes. yeah. 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 And the, the sound pressure too, like if you're mm. in loud music, you're gonna feel it. Yeah. Um, and then I even say with form and sight, like certain music can bring up visualizations like, oh, there's this guy riding a horse, but maybe that's just my own imagination. Yeah, definitely. Um maybe just repeat that for the recording because Yeah. Um so Ananda mentioned that music can bring a visual uh, uh, imagery. And um, what was the other thing? Something that you can feel when the sound pressure is mm -hmm. loud, if you're around loud music at a concert or something, that you can actually feel the music too. Yeah, yeah, and then the feeling of the vibrations um, of the music. Yeah, so those are definitely applicable. And, um, um, you know, so again, there's certain qualities basically that we would look at. And so in music therapy, now stepping into like music therapy as it's taught in the West, what I found was we talked a lot about, for example, if someone comes in and they are experiencing depression, um, you know, they're kind of, um, tend to move more slow and be more introverted and, and um, you know, what we would call tamasic in Sanskrit. And so one way to you, that you would use music and music therapy is actually first we, we would meet them where they're at. We wouldn't just say, okay, let's play it fast, you know, so that to stimulate them. Because, you know, they'd probably just walk out the door. So first, the technique is we meet them where they're at, oftentimes. So, you, you know, maybe you give them an instrument and you say, okay, improvise, play whatever you want to play. And they may start playing slowly. And then you try to um, transition from that into something more, you know, getting faster, more stimulating. And so sometimes that can help to balance, bring them out more, externalize and stimulate. Um, and so that's something uh, that's used all the time in music therapy, and it's actually very Ayurvedic. Um, so now this is where I'm trying to paint the picture of the connection, how it's, you know, how it can be used. Or, or if someone is experiencing anxiety or is hyper, again, we would tend to first meet them where they're at, allow them to express that, and kind of validate uh, their experience, and then by the end of the session, transition into something that's more calming and um, and centering. And um, so again, it's the opposite idea. Um, so this presentation is kind of an invitation for you to think about this and explore it, and also experiment. Because um, a lot of us, we tend to use music one way or another, maybe without uh, 
whether consciously or sort of unconsciously, what music we gravitate towards, what music we don't gravitate towards, and what music we decide to listen to or don't decide to listen to. Um, and so this is an invitation to, to reflect or think about, if you'd like, uh, how the qualities of the music influences you know, your own balance. And, um, and just to know that that's a very Ayurvedic way of thinking about it. Um, and uh, so any, any questions? Actually, I have yeah. a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, my first question is, um, in terms of music therapy and Ayurveda, you've been uh, really um, wonderfully covering the parallels that like increases like and um, really gradually moving toward the opposite in terms of qualities. Uh, in terms of what's needed for the client. Um, are there any differences that you've seen in terms of studying both Ayurveda and music therapy uh, in terms of an Ayurvedic approach um, from your traditional studies in terms of how you could integrate or um, create a greater shift with the client? Hmm. I think um you know, the, the, the big thing for me, the big like aha moment was that I feel like everything, every, every experience through our senses has qualities. Yeah. And, and so it's going to affect us, you know, uh, in that way that Ayurveda describes. So, so when I really think back on it, there's nothing contradictory actually. Nothing. Wow. Um, and uh, which is kind of why I wanted to, sh to share this presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, nothing, okay. nothing really comes to mind. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Um, in music therapy, we are, we, uh, you know, traditionally we'll do an assessment and then develop goals, right? So that's the main thing, you develop goals, and then, you, and then you're using music to work towards those goals, and you have different objectives, which are like your stepping stones to reaching that longer term goal. And so, um, you, you know, similarly, like in yoga, we often talk about personal goals or different things we wanna cultivate. And, um, and so again, we can use, we can use music to, to sort of encourage us to develop certain qualities. Um, and like, mm, like, well, I don't know, do, do any of you have a, have an example of maybe how you've used music that fits into, the, I'm curious. That how music has uh, been useful in your life, and does it relate to this or does it not? I, you, yes, music is a big part of my life, and um, <coughs> I didn't never think about it in, in terms of the gunas, but I, this is interesting and I like it. Um, but I definitely use it when I feel. Uh, down or depressed, I use music. Um, you know, any type of negative emotional state, music is very good and changing for me. Um, it also gives me purpose because I am a musician. So, I mean, I could go on and on and on about how music changes. And I found myself in crisis moments in my life. And the only thing that I found that was in my life that had meaning when everything else fell away was the music. So the music has guided me over and over again out of dark places. <clears throat> yeah, beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, um, so music's pretty powerful. Um, that actually inspires me to share a quote. And at, I'll, I'll see, like, a, this is the type of thing where 
if we had more time and we could do more experiential things, but we will do a, an experiential relaxation to close the session. Um, but um, a, a different uh, disciple of Swami Shivananda, Swami Satyananda, he had this, he said such a beautiful thing about music. Um, and I always think about it as like, it's the most subtle of the tanmatras, mm. you know, and actually s there's a, this idea that when something's more subtle, it's actually more powerful. Um, How would you call it more subtle than the smell? Uh, yeah, so traditionally... Maybe um, repeat that question. Yeah, how is, how is sound more subtle than smell? Traditionally, it's said that you know, like creation happened through like in this order that first there was space and then air sort of came out of that and everything and then earth was the last one. So the, it's just said to be that earth is the most gross of the elements which relates to smell and space is the most subtle. And this is going from gross to increasingly more subtle. And that's just the traditional, that's the best I can do. <laughs> That's what it's what is taught, um, but more subtle is considered uh, more powerful, actually, generally speaking. So, actually, Swami Satyananda, who was a uh, uh, guru brother of Swami Vishnu, he said this. These are his exact words: "Music has a great power. It is the greatest power." which man has discovered. You should make use of it. Through kirtan, you can reach the highest pinnacle of spiritual experience. Neither by yoga, nor by any other means, but by kirtan alone, you can have the vision of the divine. You can have the vision of yourself. You can have the vision of God. You can have the vision of Christ. You can have the vision of Mary. You can have the vision of Krishna, you can have the vision of Rama. It is possible. Music does the most important groundwork by taking away the self from you. Mm. Self lowercase. <laughs> um, so, anyways, that sort of connects it to yoga that the yogis are always speaking very highly of music. Um, and uh, I think perhaps because it's so subtle, it's related to the most subtle of our sensory experiences. So it can be very powerful. Um, and uh, yeah, so lastly, I just want to emphasize there's no like right or wrong about how to apply this idea to music. It's just an invitation to experiment and um, to, to kind of think about it. Yeah. Um, is, does harmonic structure like major or minor play a part in, in shifting this stuff? Or is it, I mean, when you're doing music therapy, would you ever use minor? Like, I guess if someone's agitated, maybe you could use minor, I don't know. Yeah, totally. Um, so a lot of this is very subjective um, and sometimes cultural. So in music therapy, what really matters is the client's subjective experience because, um, or the participant's subjective experience. Because like, for example, Jewish music, there's a lot of, in the, in the Jewish tradition, there's a lot of music in minor keys that are actually really happy. So someone coming from that cultural background, they may associate more happy feelings with minor melodies. You know, I think like, I think Hava Nagila, you know, <laughs> it's like all about celebration and it's in minor key. Um, and they're dancing and happy and, you know, raising people up on chairs. And well, actually, I, I just wanted to comment on that. Um, interestingly enough, in, in Ayurveda regarding food, they do say that the food you grew up with mm. is, is very important. So it's not because of the familiar it's 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 good for you because there's that familiarity and there's that comfort that it brings 
So that sounds very familiar to that. Yeah, totally. And uh, so, so it's kind of also in music therapy, it's, it's, um, we have to understand what is the client's subjective experience. And that's why I kind of mentioned, this isn't all black and white. It's not that you can say, okay, this means that, you know, classical music is better for you and rap music is not good for you because whatever. Actually, the music therapy research um, does not validate that idea whatsoever. Um, what it does validate is the music that has more meaning and that's preferred by the individual is what will tend to be more effective for them. So the music that has you know meaning to you, that you feel a connection with, that you love, um, you know, then that's the music that you will tend to respond to. Um, and, you know, so like I was working with teenagers where they loved rap music. And so my task was how can I use their preferred music in a way that's therapeutic, that's actually working towards some positive goals. And part of that was exposing them to rap music with a positive message mm -hmm. in its lyrics. Um, you know, but if I just went in with classical music, they'd be like, mm, dude. <laughs> it just wouldn't work. You know? um, yeah, so... Is that, would you consider that to be a part of um, meeting the participant or the client where they are? Yeah. Where they're at, at that point? Meeting them where they're at, but also not judging their own values or their own world and validating. Sure. And that's huge. Yeah. And um, an accepting, total acceptance and, and what's the word? Um, unconditional positive regard. Oh, yeah. That's the way, you know, um, and I think having that towards ourselves too. You know, is... that's, a, that's a wonderful expression. Is that something that, uh, I've actually never heard that before, unconditional positive regard. Yeah, that's a that's a huge um, uh, part of you know what a therapist is um, you know sort of taught to try to cultivate or maintain that they have to see the best in their client and not you know and then um, yeah and so actually you know. Uh, teenagers who love rap music, you know, they go to a music therapist, they think, oh, this guy's gonna not let me listen to the music I love. He's gonna want me to listen to like Mozart or something. And then when you actually say, hey, what's your favorite music? Let's, you know, listen to this. Then all of a sudden, it's, it's like, you, you know, they're like, oh, wow, like, <laughs> it's okay for me to like what I like, you know, all of that. So that's huge. Um, and, uh, but again, it still has qualities. So there still is, you know, um, like if it was music that was reinforcing aggressive behavior, for example, it's more about trying to help them to maybe understand, is this, is this reinforcing something I really want in my life? Or can I find rap music that's like, has a different message? So, um, there is that, but ultimately they have to come to their own understanding. And it's kind of, you know, it's not like a, mm, it's not, it's not, the therapist is not supposed to try to impose their own values onto them. Right? Um, so it's a little bit delicate in some cases. Actually, that, that brings me to another question that relates to Ayurveda. Um, Ayurveda is known as a science of self-healing. And mm. would you view music therapy in the same manner? It can be certainly used uh, for oneself, you know? So, um, yeah. Following I mean, up on your comment about working with a client um, or a teenager even, uh, of course, that they have to come to the understanding um, that it, you know, you're, you're there as a therapist, but you, you can't impose your judgment or values 
on that particular individual that like Ayurveda, we have to come to our own understanding of what balance is for us. Yeah. Um, would you, do you think that the music therapy really goes along with that, that approach? Yeah. Um, I think so. Like, uh, we talk about, there's this like word insight, you know, like we try to provide a space where a client can come to their own experience of, of insight. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, th I think so. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so I hope, I know this was fairly theoretical, um, but I hope that you also, I hope I conveyed it in a way that it's of some practical use or, um, to you. And, uh, I'd like to end with, uh, something more experiential and totally not intellectual. Um, is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and, I, and I'd like for this not to be recorded, I think, so that it's of just course. about yeah. us here and our own just experience. So, yeah. Do you want to, um, for viewers and listeners, do you want to um, describe the exercise that you're going to introduce to us just so they have some some idea of where you're going with this? Do you think that's useful to do? Sure, yeah. yeah. So we're going to do a practice that's called toning, which has to do with becoming aware of your body and um, oftentimes any areas of, of tension uh, or places where you may hold something um, where you want to kind of relax and we're going to improvise together doing uh, using generally different vowel sounds uh, and basically and directing those sounds into those body parts to as a therapeutic and a relaxation practice wonderful yeah yeah that's really great so it's Good. called toning i'm sure if you search on youtube about toning or something um probably tons of stuff would come up okay all right well i really look forward to participating in that Thank you. um and this was wonderful porna morte i really appreciate you integrating uh, the ancient science of Ayurveda into uh, music therapy. Wonderful. Thank you very much.